uh, who has participated in the conference uh, today. Um, as we've mentioned, just in some of the feedback, um, some great comments here. Um, and the conference team has done an outstanding job. So I uh, just wanted to take a moment once again and thank all our speakers up until this moment and also our conference team who has just done a bang up job and they always make me look good in anything I do. So uh, I wouldn't expect anything different from uh, an incredible uh, virtual conference. So my name is Ron Banerjee. I'm your moderator for this final keynote presentation. Um, it is an absolute pleasure and honor to introduce somebody who is a mentor to many of us and an inspiration um, uh, and uh, holds a special place for many of us who are in attendance today and is uh, steadfast as a champion for the organization development community. So Dr. William J. Rothwell, PhD, SPHR, SHRM, SCP, RODC, CPLP Fellow, is Professor of Workforce Education and Development at Penn State University. He is also President of Rothwell and Associates Incorporated and Rothwell and Associates LLC. With 20 years of full-time HR and OD experience in business and government before he joined Penn State, 28 years ago. He has authored 128 books on HR slash OD. He has traveled globally and has visited China 83 times, Singapore 32 times, and every Asian country more than a dozen times. His most recent books, both published in 2021, are OD Interventions, Executing Effective Organizational Change, by Rutledge, and virtual coaching to improve group relationships, process consultation reimagined. It's my pleasure to present to you Dr. William Rothwell as our final keynote sir for this year's Organization Development Conference at Penn State University. This time I will share my screen and um, just give me a moment as we transition to Dr. Rothwell's presentation. If you cannot hear the presentation, please let me know. This conference will now be recorded. Welcome. My name is Bill Rothwell, and I would like to welcome you to my session, Acquiring and Retaining Talent Using Organization Development. And I like to begin my sessions with a poll, even though there is no way for you right this moment to interact, but I use the poll simply to get you to begin with a little bit of self-reflection. So I'd like you to reflect on the following. How many of you would say that your organization has not found effective ways to attract and retain talented people right now? How many of you have found some ways to attract and retain some people? And how many of you would say that your organization found very effective ways to attract and retain people? I ask you that simply for reflection. Right this moment, one of the biggest challenges that all employers face is finding the right talent. In fact, it's a major issue. At the start of May 2021, there were more uh, job openings in the US by far than there were qualified people to take them. And the turnover rate in the US, which has traditionally been on average about 19% across all organizations has now reached an historic high of 25% and headed upward. So that means that many employers need to look for new ways, more innovative ways to attract and retain talent. 
And that's where the idea of applying organization development to talent attraction and retention comes in. In this session, I would like to talk to you about that basic idea. Of course, like any good trainer, I have targets to hit by the the end of this session, here are the two targets that I'm going to be aiming for. First, I want to describe how organization development can shed light on some creative approaches to attracting and acquiring talent, and how organization development can offer solutions to worker turnover. And like any manager who has a good agenda for every meeting, here is my agenda. I am in the introduction right now, and I will then move into talking about how can organization development improve talent acquisition and improve talent retention. So I've published many books around organization development and around talent management. And I am simply making you aware of that with this slide. So let's think about this a moment. When we attract and retain a talent, it, it, we find ourselves embroiled in major problems. Empl employers can go about this the old traditional way put up ads on job boards and put up opening notices on their websites and even resort to ancient approaches like signs outside the company or even the more creative ideas like signs along the roadside, which I've been seeing recently. But one way we can get beyond our competitors is to outsmart them. And yes, we're in a war for talent. In fact, I think it's turned into a pitched battle for talent right now. And one way we may be able to outsmart our competitors and get the cream of the crop of good talent is through focusing on using organization development. Now, here are a few facts and figures about the current talent situation globally and in the United States. According to Manpower, 69% of employers are facing some kind of problem in filling positions. And this is not a short-term issue. Long-term, according to search firm Corn Ferry, by 2030, there's going to be a shortfall of human talent of 85 million people globally. So many of the openings center around the skilled trades, like machinists, like electricians, plumbers, and so forth, carpenters in IT and in sales and marketing positions. And at the same time, 70% of US workers plan for new job opportunities in the next year. So that means turnover is probably headed up. And if it is, then that will create even more demand as employers scramble to fill those openings. So all of this poses a major challenge for employers. And we can use traditional methods. I believe that if we do what everyone else does, we will probably lose in the talent war every time. Why? Because some organizations are better equipped than others to attract top talent. Some companies have the advantage of a superior, well-known brand name, a company like Microsoft or Google or Apple. But the vast majority of companies in the United States are small businesses and medium-sized businesses, many of which 
are local only, regional only. They do not advertise on national or even international television or through banner ads on the internet. And as a result, it's difficult for those firms that many people have never heard of to compete to get the best people. And this is why an innovative approach, talent management, an innovative approach to tr trying to attract talent and trying to retain talent is needed. In short, I'm saying we can't do it the old way. We must come up with new approaches and organization development might be one option as an approach to tackle the problems we find in attracting and retaining talent. Of course, the term organization development has been around for many years. Sometimes people have trouble even quite understanding exactly what it is. If you do a Google search, you'll find many different definitions of OD, some of which can conflict with each other, and that will complicate the process of being clear on exactly what it is. But let me boil it down for you and say this. Traditionally, when we think of consulting, we think of experts who come in and they play doctor, just like a medical doctor, and they will analyze the problems your company faces, and then they will diagnose those illnesses and render recommendations for the medicine or therapy to cure those illnesses, just like a medical doctor does. The problem with that approach, of course, is that while the consultant may buy the recommended solutions, quite often managers and workers don't buy in or own the recommendations from the experts. They reject the recommendations and then all the money we spent on help from the experts is lost. Sometimes the best expert for your company is your managers and your workers. But the problem may be that they don't agree among themselves on what are the problems, what are the solutions, what are the priorities, what are the proper metrics, what are the action plans, and how do we best implement and monitor a change effort over time. And that's what OD does is it's all about facilitated change. So you might think of it like this. Traditional consulting focuses on the consultant like a medical doctor who plays expert and based on their expert knowledge, they take the responsibility for the diagnosis. They take the responsibility for rendering recommended medicine or therapy, and then they lead the organization. In the HR field and in human systems thinking, we call that approach to consulting performance consulting. And actually, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that uh, quite often people don't buy into the recommendations of the experts. Myself, I've written many books on performance consulting, and I believe it is an excellent approach that is too often misused. That being said, let me say that the OD professional does not behave in the same way that a medical doctor does. In fact, a better way of thinking, the better analogy is to cast the OD practitioner in the role of a clinical psychologist, particularly the psychologist from the field uh, coming, the school of thinking founded 
by Carl Rogers. And Rogers believed that when people came to see a psychologist, they quite often knew what their problem was, like drinking or gambling or other kinds of, of mental challenges. And he discovered that quite often, if he told people what to do, which they were often desperate for him to do, doctor, tell me what to do to solve my problem. He discovered that when he did tell them, they would go out, do it the wrong way. They wouldn't really follow his advice. And then they would blame him. So he discovered that it might be better to get people to think out their own problems, come up with their own solutions, come up with their own ways to measure success, come up with their own action plans for implementation. And that same logic can be applied to organization development. Instead of managers or consultants telling you what to do and taking on the responsibility of the diagnosis and the treatment management, instead the OD people are facilitators and they draw out the key thing that facilitators do is they ask you questions and they draw out from you the answers. And if you don't know the answers, they may help you by giving you resources, but they don't answer the question because the minute they do that, they turn into performance consultants. So there are several well-known models that guide organization development. One of them is Kurt Lewin's action research model. The other is David Cooperwriter's appreciative inquiry model. But there are many famous change models, and they can be used either from a performance consulting approach where the manager or the consultant plays expert, or they can be used uh, where the consultant or the manager plays clinical psychologist and draws the answers out of people, getting them to think and getting them to be more creative and innovative, which is so important in the current economy. So there are actually many models that could be used as long as we understand this key difference between telling people the answer and getting people to think out the answer. And of course, OD people face a challenge that often clinical psychologists do not face. Typically, not in all cases, but typically, clinical psychologists work with one person at a time. Yes, there's such a thing as group therapy. But typically, when we think of a psychologist, we think of interactions between two people, and we think of talk therapy. But OD typically works with groups of people who are mentally healthy and work in an organizational setting. And there, the problem quite often is that the people in the organization who are the best experts of the, to deal with the problems facing the organization don't agree among themselves on what the problems are, what the priorities are to solve those problems, what the best solutions are, what should be the priorities to implement those solutions, what are the best metrics or measures of success, how do we implement the change, and how do we evaluate it and get it to stick and lead to a corporate culture change. And that's the value added that organization development brings. I would add that there is another approach in OD, we call it appreciative inquiry, which literally focuses on positive change. 
And instead of looking for problems to solve in appreciative inquiry, we look for the strengths in individuals, the strengths in teams, the strengths in the organization, and then we try to build those to advantage so that the organization is stronger in the areas where it is already the strongest. So talent development is quite often focused around helping people qualify for jobs, maintain the knowledge and skills they need as times change, and to get themselves ready for promotion, either up the organization chart or across the organization chart by acquiring new and more expansive technical expertise and abilities. So developing people in talent development is often centered around something we call the 70-20-10 rule. In the 70-20-10 rule, 70% of talent development occurs on the job as part of your daily work. We try to build your capacity on the job in real time. 20% is basically peer learning, social learning. How do we learn from other people? We can do that by social media like YouTube or LinkedIn. If we have a problem, we post a question and get answers and learn from our peers. Only 10% of talent development should occur through planned training online or on site. So it turns out that if we want to attract and retain the best people, often talent development is critical as an approach. Many people today find it a very attractive when the company can company leaders can explain ways that the company will invest money in helping the worker become more productive and stay that way as times change and as knowledge becomes obsolete. So the word talent in the phrases talent acquisition, talent retention, talent development is actually very important. I did a research study on this and I found that there are many different ways that companies interpret the word talent. And depending on how you define the term talent, it can shape the kind of talent program, the kind of people we wanna attract, the kind of people we wanna develop for more responsibility, and the kind of people we want to retain. So, how do we define a key worker? How do we define a key position? It's all about what we mean by the word talent. Talent could mean job performance, promotion potential, a combination of both of those. It could refer to the gifts that I'm born with, like being good at math. It could refer to my personal strengths, what other people come to me about. It could refer to special knowledge that I have that other people don't have. It could have to do with my professional contacts, my social network. It could be any or all of the above. And it's important to be clear what we mean by talent when we set out to attract talent, develop talent, and retain talent. So talent development can be approached just like any other organizational problem. We can either call in the experts from outside the company and trust them to do the diagnosis and give us prescribed medicine or therapy to cure the problems we face. Or we could use a facilitated approach like organization development where we involve our managers, workers, and perhaps our customers, suppliers, distributors, and stakeholders in attracting talent, 
developing talent and retaining talent. So here is the well-known Kurt Lewin action research model. You know, it's been published in about a hundred different ways, different terminology used, but basically the ideas are the same. Somebody in the organization recognizes a problem. They bring in a consultant or they use someone from within the company and that person investigates what's going on, feeds back the information about the problem to the people who provided the information. Then you get the experts in your company to agree on the problem. Then we go out and we basically do the same thing to collect information about solutions, feed that back, get agreement from the people on the solutions, then we collect information on action plans to implement the solutions. We identify the metrics we will use. We feed back that information. We get our managers and our people to agree on the way to implement the solution to the problem. We get our people and our managers to agree on how to measure success. We evaluate the results. We make sure it sticks in the corporate culture, what we call institutionalization or adoption. And at some point, our helper, who could be from inside the company or from outside the company, will leave. And it could even be the consultant is the manager who is helping do this. The thing is, though, that often managers have not been trained on how to use a model like this. And, you know, I've used this model many times, and when I, and I've talked about it in many countries. And when I do that, often the first question I get is, how can you do all of these steps in a reasonable period of time? Won't it take too long to implement all these steps. Well, you know, I've used all these steps in a one hour meeting. And we can use this model to focus around, we can involve our workers, we can involve our managers in coming up with ways, innovative ways to attract talent for the company and retain talent for the company. And we can do it quickly, particularly using the many software packages available to help uh, facilitate online thinking and online learning. All of this can be used for online decision making, and we can speed up this model if we use the right technology and we use the right facilitation methods. So in summary, I talked about how OD might shed some light on creative approaches to attracting and acquiring talent. And we can do the same thing with turnover. I published an instrument, 100 ways to drive down turnover. And I didn't just make those up out of the air. I analyzed many research studies on employee turnover and how to drive it down. And every one of those 100 items in my instrument came from a research study. So the average company, when they, the leaders take my instrument, they score a 20%. So there is much room for improvement and how we go about retaining the best people. So I want to thank you for listening to me today, and I want to welcome you to the OD conference that will also cover many other topics relevant to talent. Thank you. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me at this email address.
Dr. Rao, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, at this time, we are going to go into our Q&A session. Um, and what I would ask is that in your, um, in your reactions area, if you can uh, raise your hand, I think we have a, a substantial amount of people and uh, we get Dr. Rothwell, not very often. So uh, what a great opportunity and I'll do my best to get to all your questions and feel free to use the chat box as well. And I will uh, inform Dr. Rothwell of those questions. So uh, is there anyone at this time who would like to ask a question to Dr. Rothwell? Okay, Dr. Rothwell, uh, you have a question from Amy. And that question is, what is the difference between left and right side of this? Are these diagnostic steps linear? No, they aren't. That's why it was presented in my model as a circle, because in the real world, people often jump around. It is not treated in a specific sequence. For example, we may do, we may guide a group through diagnosing their own issues with recruiting talent, feed it back and get agreement. But then there may be substantial opposition to the findings and we may have to repeat the assessment. So as a result, it is not a linear model. It is one where there may well be a need to allow the flexibility. That's why it's shown as a model or as a circle so that people can take it in any order. Thank you, Dr. Rothwell. Another question was, you mentioned several possible definitions of talent and how those terms might shape a talent development program. Could the same logic apply to OD? And is there more than one way to understand OD? Yes, there is more than one way. Of course, OD does have a core set of values. Dr. Yoon has done an excellent job of research on that topic, identifying core values within OD. But there are outliers, just like in the field of psychology, there are 200 different schools of thought about psychology. And each one of those schools of thought leads to different approaches to helping people in therapeutic settings with psychology. In fact, one of my dreams someday is to do a book examining every school of psychology and how that might apply to the OD field. That would be a heck of a project. And so, yes, I think OD does have some core beliefs but I believe that uh, we see evidence of the difference between diagnostic versus dialogic OD, the difference between the Kurt Lewin problem solving oriented OD versus the Cooper Ryder uh, strengths based approach to OD. And all of those methods could be used in uh, dealing with uh, surfacing good ways to recruit people, talented people, and retain talented people. We draw on our best experts, our own people, in the process. And that was a key message I was trying to make. Now I can't hear you, Ron. I'm sure we hear Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm used to... Uh myself when you're talking. Uh, we have an, we have another question from Carol. Do you see agile model having a lasting presence like ARM and AI? Yes, I do. And I think there are a number of models that, uh, that may be uh, one of the issues we have to cope with these days is how do we make strategic change faster? 
And I think the speed issue is one that is giving everyone heartburn because uh, we may be able to speed up machines and technology, but trying to speed up groups of people to adopt radical change uh, creates a lot of negative problems. But I do believe agile model as well as other models that have been emerging and very creative approaches to try to deal with sudden crises, a uh, loss of a key position or a key job holder. Those may require us to rethink our approaches to manage change. But, but for the most part, I think ARM and AIM have both been field tested in every culture in the world. And when they are properly applied, they work. Thank you, Dr. Rothwell. We have another question from uh, Lean. And she says, with all the innovative changes in the workforce, job roles and job competencies, and even jobs themselves changing or being eliminated, how do you continue to develop talent when talent itself is a moving target? What is the future of talent development? Well, I think that uh, the idea of micro learning uh, is critical. Micro learning is all about how we can package skill building and competency building efforts in small packages that can be delivered quickly and in short periods of time to upgrade people's skill set. But we do it on a micro level as opposed to a macro level would be something like a very long degree program or uh, attendance in a multi-week uh, development effort, but or a job rotation that might last two or three years, which a lot of multinational companies often did for skill building. But the, I think one of the futures is stackable credentials where we are able to uh, stack tiny bits of learning, micro learning, and eventually acquire larger qualifications like certifications or degrees. So I think that's one of the approaches. I also think we have to start to take a broader view of talent development and put it in context. And what I mean by that is there's many ways to get work done. And human effort is only one of those ways. I published a book with 100 ways to get work done without hiring and without promoting anybody. And multinational companies, believe me, have managed to do that. Uh, there's three ways to fill a position. You promote from within, you hire from outside, or get this, you do something else. And that something else may well be the creative thinking involved in getting work done, rather than limiting yourself just to the human side may be the key to the future. Thinking in more complex ways uh, than limiting ourselves to filling positions with another warm body. Dr. Rothwell, we have another question. Could you elaborate more on how talent development can be implemented using OD and how alternative approaches to change might be used to implement training and development okay. and talent well, development? Um, it's a learning curve dealing with organization development, even though OD has been around since the 1940s and Kurt Lewin's work. Uh, even today, there are many companies struggling with the concept of OD. I just had a conversation this morning with a student of mine who's in a company that has uh, launched an OD department, and she's in a brand new OD department, 
and they're trying to figure out what does OD do and how do they explain it to their senior leaders? And this is rather amazing. They get approval for a department and no one's quite sure what it's gonna do. That's a first. But anyway, the point I'm making is that OD itself, uh, people need to understand what it is. And I find a lot of confusion about that. We still find many managers, many OD people think that they can analyze a problem and issue recommendations and that that's OD and that is not OD. You do not tell the client what to do. You never tell the client what to do. You guide the client to figure out what he or she will do. We can approach talent development using the same approach. And in fact, OD is often confused with International Coaching Federation's model for coaching when they've been, done a fabulous job of globally training and certifying coaches using non-directive approaches where they use questioning to draw out of the manager, how do you wanna change? What are you gonna do to change? How will you implement your change? That's an OD approach. A lot of people understand that approach in coaching. They have trouble making the logical leap to applying the very same idea to any other type of change effort, including talent development. And so I think we can use OD instead of doing a needs assessment where we look for deficiencies, what's wrong, we can draw out of people what they believe needs to be improved and how, what steps, what approaches should be used to do the improvement. If they don't have enough information, then we guide them on strategies to get that information. We never tell them the answer. The minute we do, we're playing doctor. Dr. Rothwell, we have about two minutes left and we have, are there any other questions from from the field before I ask the other question that I have here. Again, I'm scanning our participants. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can indicate that in our chat box as we prepare to wrap up. Does anybody have any last minute questions for Dr. Rothwell? Scanning our audience now, Dr. Rothwell. Maybe they are eager to go to the weekend. It's happy hour somewhere, isn't that what they say? Dr. Rothwell, one final question then. How could positive change theory apply to talent development? In other words, how do you feel AI might be used to implement uh, talent development programs. I think it has been widely used that we, we start to look for people's strengths and then we build our learning plans, our individual development plans on how to intensify their and build on their personal strengths. And not everyone understands what their strengths are. That's why the Strengths Finder instrument is so popular and it's a revelation to a lot of people who use that instrument exactly what the instrument shows their strengths to be. And once you know your strengths, you know your competitive advantage and areas where you can build that competitive advantage just exactly the same way that a, a company could do the same thing. So, um, I see a lot of things coming into the chat box, but I'm not sure I understand them all, but that's all right. Uh, but I do think you can apply appreciative inquiry or strengths-based thinking to any type of development activity 
one of the key views of someone like Marcus Buckingham is that workers should seek out opportunities where they can play to their strengths. And that's very much an appreciative inquiry way of thinking about talent development. Play to your strengths, or if you wanna develop new strengths, then you have to have opportunities for practice. Remember Malcolm Gladwell's comment that if you practice anything for 10,000 hours, you will be a world-class expert in that field of study, whatever it is. So same logic. If you build your strength, you want to build a new strength, you got to practice, practice, practice up to 10,000 hours if you want to be world-class best. So that'd be my answer. Thank you, Dr. Rothwell. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, uh, if you have any other questions that we did not get to, you can reach Dr. Rothwell at wjr9 at psu.edu. That's wjr9 at psu.edu. It's been our pleasure to provide you the first verbal conference for OD, Leading Organization Change Through Innovation. We want to thank our speakers who attended, all of our global participants, and all of our students that made this possible, the student team, the conference team. Uh, congratulations on another excellent job. The conference team did a fabulous job with this conference. Thank you so much. Again, that brings uh, the virtual conference, uh, our first annual virtual conference to a close. Thank you again and best wishes to all of you for success in the future. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Think about uh, presenting next time. <laughs> yes, we need speakers for next year. Thank you. Do we need to stop recording now? Yeah, I think.